very much, and it's lovely to see every one of you here on this Friday evening. It's the closing night of this special brief series concerning the coming of the world's rightful ruler and king. His name is Jesus Christ, and the world has not seen the last of him. He's coming back, and when he comes, the whole world will know. It's nice to see you all this evening, and thank you once again for being with us. This being the last night, I want to say just a brief but very sincere word of thanks, first of all, to the pastor of this church, Pastor George McConnell. I'm sorry he's not been able to be with us, but that's okay. He's uh, uh, on good business, and I wish that you'll get, hope that you'll give him my warm regards. And then for the elders and the leaders here at the tabernacle, especially to my host and hostess, Harvey and Ann McConnell. My, I stopped in a good hotel, I can tell you. And I'm going to have to cut back when I get home to England tomorrow. Maybe you'll remember me tomorrow. Half past one, the boat will sail out of Larne Harbour. You know where that is, don't you? Larne Harbour, the boat will sail out. If I'm not out on board, it'll go anyway. So I'm hoping to be on board at half past one. And then two hours later, I'll be across the water. My car is uh, in the compound at Cairn Ryan. And then I drive maybe two and a half, perhaps three hours, down to Lancashire, which is where uh, I've lived now for about 30 years. Although I'm a West Country man, um, I live in the north of England. So once again, it's been a lovely joy to greet friends. Some of them, I, some of you I've known for a many, good many years. Um, I've been coming over here a good many years, ever since 1969. I came over here when the trouble started the same year, 1969. I think it was in the September of that year. And I came to Dungannon. You know where Dungannon is, County Tyrone? And we had a wonderful, wonderful mission. Many, many, many were, came to know Christ. Some are now in the ministry. And ever since those days, I've had many happy visits to the north of Ireland. And it's been lovely also to meet many new friends, uh, many dear friends, and it's been really great to get to know you as the week's gone by, being able to get to know you a little bit, find out who belongs to who and who doesn't belong to who, and to find out the different folks here. Thank you for your love and thank you for your welcome. I'm gonna miss you. I live alone these days. The Lord is with me, but uh, I live uh, in uh, my home, my dear wife went to be, most of you will know with the Lord, two years ago this month, and I miss her very much. I've had a very dear wife. Um, I know where she is, and that's a great comfort to know that she's, as Philippians 2 says, she's with Christ, sorry, Philippians 1, with Christ, Paul says, which is far better. So thank you for your lovely fellowship, your company, I have had uh, lots of lovely fellowship, and um, why the food you people have here in Northern Ireland, you like good food, and I enjoy the good food as well. I'm going to miss it next week and in the weeks to come. Thank you so much for your fellowship. If you would like to take my prayer letter, you can uh, leave your name and address with young James. As you go out through the foyer of the church, on the left, there's the bookstore. Please have a look there, and you'll see a number of interesting things. But there's a list there, you'll see it, and James will show it to you, where if you wish, I warmly invite you to join my prayer list. Um, I send out in early December two prayer letters. One is my own, which is the ministry that I have with next year's appointments, and a little word of ministry, and you can follow us in prayer, follow me in prayer. And then the other one is uh, Balkan Vision, which is a charity which I set up about, I think about eight or nine years ago uh, for my work in Romania. And uh, I shall be there, God willing, I plan to be there. Not got the flights booked yet, but they will be soon for Romania. And I go out there every January and in the year as well. I go to children's, uh, young people's camps. Uh, when I get to Romania in January, It'll be nearly 20 below zero, and they have to de-ice the plane every time you go anywhere. 
and that keeps you, that's good for your prayer life, friends. I can tell you, you see these young boys with the stuff spraying all over the airplane to de-ice the wings of the plane. You really want to tap the window and say, hey, you've missed a bit over here. It's a bit scary, but we, I go with others every January. If you would like news of the ministry of Balkan Vision and my own ministry, I would be so delighted if you just filled in your name in block capitals, please, so I can read it easily and your address and your postcode. And there's no charge, but I will send the prayer letter out in uh, <coughs> November time. Please have a look too at the DVDs. You won't find them in any shop, even Bible shops. Uh, you won't be able to get them. They're ones that are sent out from um, Living Word Ministries, which I'm linked up with. And there's seven, uh, uh, five discs, seven messages, which I gave in Bournemouth last year. Very, very informative concerning the prophetic future. It's called Seven Final Facts. And a number of other good books and DVDs are there. And young James, he will see to you. And he's been very good. And I wish to thank him too. He's been such a good help to me. I could deal with him coming over to England and coming with me everywhere because he's been a real help. And uh, it's been great to have met him as it has all of you. Well, we thank the Lord for his precious word, friends. As night by night we've gathered around an open Bible. You know, I wasn't brought up in a Christian environment. I was sent to Sunday school, but I think it was really just... Uh, my mother, we, it was the only mom in the home I was brought up in. We just had mother, nobody else. But my mother used to send us, I had a brother, to uh, Sunday school. Every Sunday afternoon, I had to go to Sunday school. Those were the days when you had to go to Sunday school. I didn't want to go. Some people say, well, you shouldn't make your, boy, your children go to Sunday school if they don't want to go and force as some say that awful word religion on them hey but wait a minute I never wanted to go to day school and learn reading writing and arithmetic either so if, if I wasn't made to go there I would have never learned all those things and I'm glad I was made to go to Sunday school I had to go every Sunday but I think that for my home it was like the old hymn peace perfect peace with loved ones far away that's what it was but in 1954, I bet, I, I'll tell you when the date was, and then you can do the rest of the arithmetic. I was in my middle teens. I was invited to a Billy Graham relay meeting. Now, these were old days. There was no picture of the preacher, just the, a speaker. I remember that it was a sort of a evangelistic uh, relay, they called it, from Haringey, London. And I remember seeing all these different preachers, some of them whom I knew from the little Sunday school, sitting along the platform with this little old-fashioned speaker in the middle of them. I remember a, a little boy, I was only 14, I remember thinking, boys, if they're all going to preach tonight, we'll be here till midnight. But it wasn't like that. Soon the little crackly speaker came on from London. Uh, I loved the singing. They sang, How Great Thou Art. I like that hymn. And then, great is thy faithfulness. I've always loved the hymns of the church. And that prepared my young heart. But the preacher seemed to speak right to me. That strong, authoritative, biblical preaching. It seemed to wake me up deep in my heart. I don't remember what the preacher said. But I do remember he said this. Ladies and gentlemen, God loves you and went like a knife right through here. It was real. God loves you. And then he said, Jesus Christ died for you. And that seemed to get right into my heart and mind and spirit. And then he said, if you will give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, he will give eternal life to you. If you will repent and give your life to Jesus Boys, nobody had to beg me to go to the front. It, it was everything that my, I didn't understand my own heart. But that night I understood, this is what I've been looking for. This is what I want. This is why I was born. This is the reason I've got my life. And I went forward that night and I asked Jesus Christ, 
to come as a living personal redeemer into my young life. Thank God he came and he's been with me ever since. He's promised he's never going to leave me or forsake me. But I want to tell you something else. Not long after I gave my life to the Lord and I was saved and I knew I was saved, I'd say this evening, friends, you can't be saved and not know it. And you can't be saved and not show it. It's going to make a difference to us. Not long after I was saved, I, I didn't understand what was going on. I do now. I went through a deep, what I call a valley experience. You know what that is? I was going through a valley of darkness, confusion, doubt. I felt as though the devil was chucking everything he got at me. And I thought, I don't know. Maybe I'm not a Christian. Maybe I, maybe I don't believe all of this. Maybe I've been stupid. Maybe this is, I was in a dark valley of deep, uh, yes, spiritual oppression. I've met many young people that have had the same. Many of those young people went on to effectively serve Jesus Christ. I've wondered through the years, did the devil make a frantic, desperate effort to stop me in my tracks? He knew that the Lord would call me into the work of the ministry such as it is. Friends, I'm just one of God's little runabouts. I'm nobody special. But whether the, whether the devil tried to stop me, when I was in a, a spiritual darkness, a valley experience, I call it. And I went along to the little gospel hall at home, and there was a little man in that hall. He used to come around to different churches. I knew him. His name was Mr. Orr, and that's a big name over here, right? You have people called Orr. And he was called Mr. Hall. We used to laugh at him because when he came to church, he couldn't hear much and he had a hearing aid, a very primitive one, which meant a leather strap around here and a box on your chest. And all through the service, he would be doing this and it used to go like that. And we kids, we used to laugh because uh, he it used to make such a whistling noise. Uh, they were very primitive things in those days. We used to laugh at him. I did know he'd been a blacksmith. Very ordinary man, I, I'm not sure that he could read or write. One thing I did know about him, he knew God. When I got to the door of the, of the gospel hall in Devon where I was brought up, a dear old man put his arm around my shoulder, sort of like a dad would, and I'd never known that, and I liked it. He says, Alec, you belong to Christ and you're saved. I says, Mr. Orr, I, I think so. I've not been so sure lately. I've been through a bad time. I can't understand it, but I say my prayers and there's a brick wall and all that. I don't remember what he said to me and I'm going to tell you what he said to me tonight. He says, Alec, remember this. Your life is like a hotel with a thousand rooms and departments in it. When you were saved, you invited Jesus Christ to come through the front door. John chapter 1. As many as received him. That's all. As many as invited him in by faith. As many as received him. That's all. To them gave he the power to become the sons of God. When you were saved, he says, Alec, you invited Jesus Christ to come into the door through the front door. But listen, he doesn't want to be kept standing in the hallway. He wants you to invite him into every part of your life. The games room, the girls room. I don't know why I said that for. I was only 14. The smoking room. Oh. The drinking room. Every part of that hotel, the Lord Jesus wants you to open the door. Boys, that shook me. I went home that night. And I got on my knees to pray as I always did, even when it was hard. You know, young people, sometimes it's hard to pray. Sometimes it's harder for old ones. I remember a dear old brother saying to me when I was a young Christian, a babe in Christ. He says, Alec, when you find it hardest to pray, pray hardest. That's when you're in your greatest need. That's good advice. And I've tried to keep to it. That night I went home and I fell on my knees and the Lord showed me. Jesus wasn't Lord of all. 
There were rooms I got locked against him. I didn't want him to talk to me about that bit of my life. I didn't want him to stop me doing that thing. There was a lot of things in my life I'd locked the door. I didn't want Jesus to be Lord of all, so he wasn't <coughs> Lord at all. If Jesus isn't Lord of all, then Jesus Christ isn't Lord at all. Make sure you've given him unobstructed access to your life. For we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. He doesn't want to be left standing in the hallway. He wants you to welcome into him, into every department and room of the hotel that's you. And it's a big hotel, many, many parts of us, our minds uh, and our hearts and our wills and our volition and indeed our bodies which must be presented as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Well, thank you for listening. I felt the Lord would have me to say that to you tonight. It's been a lovely joy to be with you. Thanks for your friendship and thanks for your prayers. It's been lovely to meet, meet you. When I get home, I'll have to try and get back a, a, some of the English that was in me before I come here, um, before I came to see you, if, you under, if you're following what I mean. When I'm over here, I soon get to talk a little bit like you. Thanks again for your welcome. We will turn now, please, to the Scriptures of Truth, to the first letter of Paul, the Apostle, to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, if you haven't brought your Bible with you, just listen. But if you've brought the Scriptures with you, as is best practice, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And we're at verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 12. This evening I want to finish up by talking to you, and I won't be long, about the Christian's new body, the resurrection body that we will receive when we go to be with Christ in that twinkling of an eye, which I think I tried to expound to you on Tuesday, I think it was, as we thought of the, the taking away, we call it the rapture, of the church. Now some people object that the word rapture is not in the Bible. That is quite true. The word rapture is not in our English Bible. We of course as believers use many words correctly which are not actually mentioned in Scripture. I guess the word Trinity is not in Scripture. But nothing is plainer in Scripture from Genesis 1-1 that God is one God but he is a trinity of beings. He is a tripartite being. God is one, yet he is three. But the trinity is not in the scripture. Now the word rapture doesn't appear in our English Bible, but hold on, it's in the Latin Bible, the Vulgate. And in that Bible, the word is used in 1 Thessalonians, we'll not read it this evening, caught up together with them. Two words in our English Bible, caught up, one word in the Greek Bible, harpazo, and it is related to the word rapture, or in the, um, in the Latin Bible, rapere, which means to suddenly take something from one place and remove that object to another place. That's all it means. And at the rapture, if the word is not in the New Testament in English, all the conditions of it are. What it describes is certainly in the, in the New Testament. Is the Lord coming to take away his people? Every truly blood-redeemed child of God will be taken from the earth. And when we have gone, as I mentioned the other night, hell will be let loose. And the seven years of Daniel's prophecy, the 70 weeks, 69 fulfilled, one week of years, seven years yet to come, will begin. Now this evening I'm going to talk to you, God willing, in a moment. I have something to say first. We shall think about when we're taken up to be with Christ, something to encourage us on the final Friday. What is this new body? Paul writes, and we shall see, we shall be changed. We shall be changed. Yes. He's talking about the bodies of believers, the believers who've gone before, and their dear dust lies in the cemetery. They will be changed, resurrected. 
And we too who are alive, should we be alive when the Lord gets back? We don't know when he will come, but should we be alive until, as Paul writes it, and if we that remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede them, but we too will not be resurrected, but we will be translated. Resurrection translated. Tra translation so that the whole of the redeemed body of Christ, the bride, will be taken in a moment to be with the Lord. And we're going to get a lovely new body like unto his resurrected body. And I'm going to talk to you about that in a moment. 1 Corinthians 15, and we read, please, friends, from verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be, that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of them uh, that sleep. I want you to go down this very long chapter, please, if you're following in your Bible, to verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, earthy, that is, we have a human body, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We read this the other night. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on, a, a lovely expression, put on in change immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, friends, we discovered on Tuesday night, those of you who were here, and if you weren't, it's okay. We shall just... Uh, go back to the thoughts that we shared there, but we shall move on to there. You will know that the future hope of the church, dead and alive, is that moment when the Lord will come to harpazo or catch away his church, caught up to meet him in the air. I wonder how many of us think about the aftermath and the result of the rapture of the church. I sometimes think that the rapture will produce in the secular world the biggest sensation the world has ever known. Do you think that? What will the world think? And what will the world say? I sometimes think that on global television, the BBC, CNN, Fox News, Africa News, all over the world, and the world's newspaper, banner headlines, all over the world, the newspapers will read right across the front two words, missing millions. Missing millions. Television will bring the same message. All over the world, millions of people will have strangely, unexplainedly disappeared. 
Some of them were on trains, some of them were on aircraft, some of them were working, some were sleeping. But all over the world, an astonishing phenomenon has taken place. The puzzle of the missing millions. And all a baffled world will say is, well, they were all religious. Right. No. Wrong. We were not the religious ones. We were the redeemed ones. The ones that belonged to Jesus Christ and were his. You're not your own, writes Paul in 1 Corinthians 6. You're bought with a price. And he's coming to collect his purchased possession, his bride. And when we've gone, the world will wonder what has happened to us. And the world will miss us. Will family members who are not saved miss us? And the boys at work and the girls at university college, will they miss us? What will they say? What will they think? What will they make of the global television news coverage? There's a little verse in Hebrews 11 and verse 5. Look it up in your Bibles. It's an interesting verse. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. It's speaking of the private kind of rapture that Enoch had. And look what it says. Hebrews chapter 11, and we're at verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated. He was removed. He was taken home privately to be with the Lord. As I see, he had a kind of a private rapture, as we shall have a... A, a, a public rapture with all the saints that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation or we might say his rapture he had this testimony that he pleased God I pray that it might be my testimony before I go that I please God look back up the first verse at th four little words and was not found. Can you see them there? Four little words in the middle of Hebrews 11 and verse 5. And was not found. Enoch by faith was translated that he should not see death, just as we will be, and was not found. Does that suggest to your mind, as we read the scripture, that there was a kind of a manhunt for him? He was not found. They looked for him. There was a manhunt for him. Where is he? Maybe his family said, well, we, we can't understand this. Dad went to the prayer meeting on Thursday night. Others will say, well, I saw him last week. Maybe his wife will say, well, he went to bed last night. I don't know what's happened to him. He was not found. And when we have gone, the world will look for us wonder where we've gone. Many Christians think that when the rapture happens, it will be such a shock to the people of the world that they will all turn to Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, the human heart will not respond in that way. The Bible says that when the rapture happens, the years of the beast will begin. And God will send those who receive the mark of the beast on their right hand or on their forehead. will take the mark of the beast. God will send them strong delusion that they should believe, believe the lie. Friends, the most important thing in this world is to be saved and to know Christ personally. To be saved is to be saved for the future. And how wonderful that when Enoch went, they searched for him, but he was not found because the Lord had taken him. Will there be a search for us when we are taken by the Lord? Now, I want, as I say, to come to you to, toward the close of what I want to say, I want to talk to you about the Christian's new body. When we are taken, like Enoch was translated, undoubtedly he also received a resurrection body, although he was, I guess, an Old Testament saint. But friends, we too will be raptured to be with him and to be like him 
And I'll show you that lovely verse in a moment. I want you to turn once again to 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll look in detail from verse 35. 1 Corinthians 15, we we'll go back to it to look at it in detail at, at verse 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Put your finger, brothers and sisters, under that little word come at the end of verse 35. It, it's a common question. How will the dead be raised up? Is it credible and possible that bodily resurrection, just like the Lord Jesus had, you can search the Middle East, you won't find his body anywhere. Other great religious leaders, that you can go and see their mausoleums, pay respect at their tombs and graves, but Jesus had no grave. The grave was empty. Yes, he was raised and then he ascended back to his Father. We too will have a resurrection. We too will be raised from the dead. But how are the dead raised up? And we looked the other night at the uh, uh, scientific side of things, that the scientists tell us that nothing in the world can be actually destroyed once it's created or made, can only be changed. Remember we saw that if you get a piece of paper and you put it in the fire, you say, what did you do with that old uh, bill or something like that? Oh, I destroyed it, I put it in the fire. You haven't destroyed it. You've changed it. Gather the ash, and the gases, they are still in the biosphere somewhere, changed, but not destroyed. And we could speak about this quite a bit. How are the dead raised up? Friends, it's a mystery and it's a miracle, but the dead will be raised, just as the Lord Jesus was raised. And here we are told in verse 35, um, how are the de dead raised up? And with what body shall they come? And then Paul says, Thou fool, or foolish ones, that which thou sowest is going to the field or the garden. That which you sow is not quickened, that is, it doesn't bear the new life, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but bear grain. We all know this, who are gardeners and farmers. It may chance of wheat or some other grain. Here the apostle says, how foolish to ask, how are the dead raised up? You know what happens when you take a grain of wheat, perhaps of one kind or another strain, and you put that seed into the ground, and it's got to die until it dies, it cannot bring forth the fruit. And the fruit will come and the harvest will come when the seed is committed to the ground. And Paul, throughout the, and it's throughout the New Testament, and in the Old Testament too, saints are in scripture terms buried in the ground. Now that brings up a little problem that's uh, to some minds, not to my mind. What about Friends, like uh, mom and dad, sometimes were cremated. Well, it won't make any difference. I just say this might help someone. Whether we're buried, uh, that is, we're interred. A pastor, as a pastor, some 30 years, you inter them in the ground, ensure in certain hope, the resurrection to eternal life, and then the grave is uh, filled in over the series of time the body is assimilated into the ground or whether that body is burned uh, friends it won't make any difference uh, because from the dust from that body which cannot be destroyed only changed the Lord will raise that dust again friends how interesting that the Lord will will do that of course, in cremation, the only thing that is lost is the, is the seed. The scripture says our bodies are sown in weakness. Sown in weakness. 
planted in the ground, as the scripture says that. But whether some of the saints were blown to bits in the war, some of them were buried at sea, and so on. It won't make any difference. The Lord knows where that dust is, and the one who in his omniscience created us from the dust of the earth will make us back uh, again. The Christian's new body will be the result of death, the seed bursting into life um, at the resurrection morning, and from that grave will come a body raised, re because our souls as believers will have gone to be with Christ to death. That's what happens when a believer dies. Our souls go to be with the Lord. How do we know that? Philippians 1.23. Paul says, I have a desire to depart. What happens when a Christian dies? He tells us there, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. So my soul will go to be with the Lord. My body will sleep in the ground. And on that resurrection morning, in the twinkling of an eye, body and soul will be reunited. And the body will be raised from the grave, brought from the dead, from among the dead. The rest of the dead will remain in the graves until the end of the thousand years, we saw. But at the first resurrection, the Christian church, every born-again believer, will be taken up and will be raised. And you remember we saw this mortal must put on immortality and this corruptible must put on incorruptible. If you turn to Luke, please, chapter 4, the Gospel of Luke, and chapter 24, and we're at verse 38. I hope this is helpful to some. Uh, Luke chapter 24 and verse 38. Luke 24, 38, and 39. The Lord Jesus, perhaps we could read verse 37. But they were terrified and affrighted. This is the Lord Jesus back from the dead in the upper room. They supposed that they had seen a spirit. They saw the resurrected Christ and they said, this can't be the real Jesus. How are the dead raised up? He had told them he would be raised from the dead in three days. But they found it very hard. They thought this is a phantasm, a ghost. They thought they had seen a spirit or a ghost. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see for a spirit that is a phantasm or ghost or something hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. I learn from that verse and that wonderful episode when the Lord Jesus, the resurrected, once crucified Lord, appeared to the disciples that when I am raised from the dead as Christ was raised from the dead, his his resurrection guarantees mine. He's called the first fruits of all who sleep. His resurrection is the guarantee of my resurrection as a believer and a follower in Christ. How wonderful we discover here that the resurrection body is real. It's tangible, feelable. Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Handle me, feel me. A spirit hath not flesh and blood, as you see me have. By and by the Lord Jesus ate fish and of a honeycomb with them. Here is wonderful, blessed secrets of the resurrection body of Christ. And if Christ is raised, we shall be raised. If we're not raised, Christ is not raised. His resurrection guarantees ours. So the resurrection will, body will not be a spiritual thing. It is called spiritual. We'll come to it in a moment. But it is because it is spiritual doesn't mean it's not tangible and feelable and recognizable. We shall know each other in eternity. And what a wonderful body the Lord is going to give us. Now, I'm working toward a close, and I want you to turn to Philippians 3 and verse 20, please, and 21. A verse we looked at the other evening. Philippians chapter 3. And verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. 
from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. One translation says the bodies of our humil humiliation, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Thou fool, writes Paul to the Corinthians, how is the body raised? How shall they come? Thou fool, that which yourself you sow in the ground, a seed, and you say, well, it's dead, it's out of sight, underground. But wait, it will come up, and it will blossom, it will fruit. And it's like that with the resurrection body. It is sown in weakness. Looks as though it, it's dead, and it does die, but it will be raised into life. And here, see what Paul writes to the Philippians. We're looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus to the air, that is to the rapture, and he will change our vile body, that is these aging bodies given to sickness and pain and death. He will like fashion them like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he shall subdue all things unto himself. I want you to turn back to 1 Corinthians 15 and a few thoughts from verse 49. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 49. I hope you're following in your Bibles. Not nice to see your heads down and see Christians following in the scriptures. Friends, these Bible verses are far more important than anything this preacher's got to say to you. Have you got it? Verse 49. As we have borne the image of the earthy, that is the aging body, as we have borne the image of a human aging earthly body, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Praise the Lord. One day I'm going to get a body in which I will be able to spend eternity with in Christ. I can't spend eternity with him in this body. It's an aging body because of Adam. But one day I'm going to get a lovely new body. How wonderful. Let me say to you first of all that the resurrection body will be recognizable. Recognizable. So what about Mary that met him in the garden? Was it the morning after the resurrection? She thought he was the gardener. She couldn't believe that Christ was risen. She mistook him for the gardener. Do you remember the narrative told, I think, in the Gospel of Matthew? What about that? Well, as I studied this, friends, you can go home and look it up yourself. I really have come to see that Mary, overcome with emotion and weeping, her eyes sore with crying and weeping, she'd seen the Lord dead upon the cross. I think that was the reason why she did not know him. She didn't recognize him. In her distress and in her sadness and their tear-stained eyes, she didn't recognize him. I think that was it. But what about the two disciples then on the road to Emmaus? They didn't recognize him. The risen Jesus on the road to Emmaus about, I think it's about a hundred miles from Jerusalem, as they traveled toward Emmaus, a stranger came. They didn't know him. They didn't recognize him. I propose to you that the resurrection body, we will recognize each other. We will know each other. But they didn't know him. And he said, it, the evening is far spent. Shall we go in and have supper together? Do you remember the beautiful record? As he took the bread and broke it. Oh, it's him. It's the Savior. That's how he did it. He was known to them in the breaking of bread. So, will we know each other in the resurrection body? Friends, I studied that too, and you can when you go home. The Bible says that their, their eyes were holden, that they should not know him. Their eyes were, the Lord had holden their eyes, that they should not know him. It was in the plan of God that they should not recognize him he concealed himself from them until he broke the bread and he was known to them in the breaking of bread because the resurrection body when the disciples met him on the road they cried all hail and they fell at his feet they knew who he was and in the upper room we read the gospel of luke 
handle me and feel me. Why do you think these thoughts? They were overwhelmed with emotions of joy and unbelief as well. Handle me and see that a spirit hath not flesh and bone, blood, flesh and bones. It's a mystery there. He didn't say blood. Some believe that he was in a bloodless body because his blood, of course, was shed upon the cross. Well, that's something for another night. But he says, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Brothers and sister, sisters, the resurrection body will be recognizable. Number two, it will be imperishable. Look at verse 42. 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter. And verse 42, please. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. The bodies of believers, when they die, the body is sown in corruption. It has to be sown soon. I think here in the north of Ireland you bury your, your dear departed ones very much quicker than we do in England. In the Middle East it's got to be done, and in Africa, hot countries, within 24 hours. Yes, the body is sown of the believer. It is sown in corruption, but it is raised in incorruption. It will be raised an immortal body, an incorruptible body, sown in corruption, but raised in incorruption. We shall be raised to die no more with a body that will never feel pain, a body that will never be sick, a body that will never die, but a body that is eternal, given to us by the Savior in the trailing of an eye at the rapture. And then in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 43, please, we learn something else about the resurrection body. It is imperishable. The new body is recognizable. And then we read that it will be powerful. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Look, it is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. This was the verse that came to me in great power when, along with my dear children, we have a son and a daughter that love the Lord. We stayed by mummy's, mummy's bedside at the hospital till she breathed her very last. And we thought she'd breathed her last in just one more breath. And she was gone. And I thought of that, this verse, it is sown in weakness. Not one strength for one more breath. God bless her. What a dear wife I've had. Sown in weakness. But it will be, she'll be raised in power. In power. The resurrected body will be a powerful body. An imperishable body. A recognizable body. But in verse 44, we are told it will be a spiritual body. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body, but one that can be felt, one that is tangible. It is, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Now friends, I'm nearly out of time, but let me tell you this. The resurrection body will be a body that possesses astonishing powers. I really think, and you can put me right if you don't agree, that the resurrection body will be a body that has um, the DNA and everything changed. It will have undergone an atomic change. We find that the body of the Lord Jesus, he could pass through a wall. The disciples in the upper room <coughs> locked the door for fear of the Jews, but the Lord Jesus still appeared to them. He could hide his identity from them and reveal his identity to them. The resurrection body is a spiritual body. Maybe it will have a different atomic structure to the reality that we know now. Very, very interesting to study the resurrection body. Uh, it, it, it is a very different body, but it is the same body. And friends, let's not 
misunderstand ourselves here. Paul says earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, this mortal must put him on immortality and this corruptible must put on incorruption. So why does he say that? Because when we get the eternal life and the new body, it will be you and me. We will know each other there. We will know the Savior there. We will know the saints there. We know this. And we shall know each other. And how wonderful that we shall be like him. And we shall be like him in his eternity. One last verse. Revelation 1 and verse 18. We mustn't miss this one out. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, friends. And thank you for following so closely in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 1. The Lord Jesus is speaking. And again, it's the resurrected Jesus. Crucified, dead, buried. Ah, oh, but that's not the end. On the third day he rose again. And one day we too, like him, shall rise. I repeat myself, his resurrection guarantees yours and mine. He's called the first fruits, the guarantee of those who sleep. Revelation 1.18, perhaps we read verse 17 to get the sense of verse 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me and said unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. In other words, the Lord Jesus says, Fear not, I am he that is alive, although I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I will never, ever die again. And neither will those who die in the Lord. We shall have a life and an existence and a glorified body that will die no more. And then he says to John, I have the keys of hell Hallelujah. and death. Friends, isn't that great? You know... I don't believe I shall ever die until it's the Lord's time for me to die. The key of the time of the death of a believer is never an accident. It's an appointment. The Bible says it's appointed unto men. Hebrews 11, this is verse 19. It's appointed unto men once to die. And after that, the judgment. He's speaking, there are guests of unbelievers. We shall not come into judgment and condemnation. We'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. We thought about last night, but that's a different matter altogether. But death is an appointment. It's appointed unto men once to die. And there have been a number of times in my life, uh, two times in my life, my life has been threatened. Maybe you've had the same. Uh, people have threatened to kill me two times. I won't bother to tell you about it, but um, Thank the Lord, and not at this moment, not in recent few years, but uh, I've been in very difficult situations with dangerous people and uh, very hard people, but how wonderful to know. And in January when the plane takes off from Munich and lands and then we take off on the way back from Sibiu with all the snow falling and the, they spray the wings over, I think Jesus has the keys of death and hell. I shall not die until he calls me. I am immortal until my life's work is done. When my life's work is ended, then I shall go. Not a moment before, he says to John, I am he who was dead. John could say, yeah, I saw it. I saw you hang there. I remember how the Lord Jesus died on the cross. The seven cross utterances, finishing up with, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he told me to take care of his mother. I was there when he died, and the Lord Jesus said, I am he who was dead, but behold, I'm alive forevermore. I'm never going to die again. And I have the keys of death and hell. He is Lord of the, of the living and the dead. Friends, you've listened so well. I want to finish right here like this. I conducted the funeral service some, not many years ago, 
in uh, Yorkshire. That's a nice county. Yorkshire is our biggest county across where I come from. Um, and the Yorkshire people are very proud of where they come from. And uh, often it's nice to hear the Ulster people proud of where they come from. You have, friends, you have a lovely country here. You know that, don't you? You don't seem to agree, but I think it's all right. I think you do. And what a joy it's been to spend these days here in the beauty of the morns. You live in a lovely place. What a glorious place, the mountains, when you can see them. You can't see them every day. When the sun gets through, you live in a spectacular part. Very, 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 very beautiful. But friends, listen, it's not where you've come from, it's where you're going. That's what counts. That you know whom you have believed and that you're headed for a land that's even better and brighter than the morns. And that's saying something. And that's an Englishman telling you that. So that's pretty good, isn't it? And I live near the Lake District too. That's pretty good. The morns take some beating. And the kindness of the people I met all this week and out on the streets on Wednesday, that was great. I really enjoyed it. I live here, I'd be out there every week. It was great to meet them. Yes, there's all of that. Well, uh, years ago in Yorkshire when I passed it there, I had to take the funeral, sadly, of a young man. Let's face it, we, we die all ages. Just be ready, that's all. And uh, as the grave, uh, as I stood at the grave, as the pastor, and said the words, which we have to say from the book of offices, two little boys stood with their grandma and with their mummy. I don't know about you, little children always touch my heart. I've always loved people and I've always loved children. I've always loved families and mums and dads. The very sacredness of home and family and children. Did you know that marriage and conception and love and little children, the beauty and the intimacy of the God-ordained marriage bond is the most holy thing in the physical realm on earth, do you know that? And do you know the devil's at it? To destroy it, deny it, make it as though it's nothing. Friends, you need to keep praying. Well, I stood by the graveside and stood at the head of the grave and with the word of God we sang a hymn. And I'll never forget, I didn't actually hear it, but the little boy's grandma told me, I saw that he said something to his grandma and I was very troubled to see the little boy, of course, with the tears. I wondered if they'd bring him to his daddy's graveside. I'm glad they did. And he came, and as the coffin was lowered in, the little boy spoke to his grandma. She said to me, when we were having a cup of tea, the little boy said to me, and she was having a tear too, I wish I had a daddy who would never die. And you would miss him. I wish I had a daddy that would love me that never died. Something like that. Friends, I preach to you tonight a never dying Savior. His name is Jesus. He's the man who is God. With him you're safe for time and eternity. Without him you're lost for time and eternity. Make sure you're his. Make sure you belong to him. And that one day when in the providence and will of God, the key of your death is turned. The Lord will call you and me. Make sure that you'll go to be with that man who said, I am alive forevermore. For Christians are going to live forever. Amen? Christians are going to live forever. Here or there, we're going to live forever. But we shall never die. The body will be laid in the ground. And um, I often say this, if you ever read in the paper somewhere or in some Christian periodical that Mr. Passmore, the preacher, is dead. You might read that one day. And you'll read, it'll say a little thing. There won't be much in the papers when I go. I'm nobody, part, nobody important. But you might read one day, and Mr. Passmore is dead. Don't you believe it? I'll be more alive when they're reading that than I ever was. Amen? Amen. I shall I'll not be dead. I'll have arrived home with the Lord. 
I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and hell. Thank you for listening. We're going to sing a lovely hymn. It's going to come up on the board, and we haven't got...